Well, I was thinking a little bit about my hometown uh, the other day. Those of you who don't know, I grew up in uh, Greenwood, Arkansas, uh, basically uh, Podunk Holler. Uh, 3,317 people lived there when I was growing up. And, but the thing is, downtown they had this drive-in restaurant. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm, I miss this restaurant. They had the world's best French fries. The L and J drive-in. I mean, they, they you know they had good uh, root beer floats. They had they had good hamburgers, but their French fries, man. I mean, it was just fantastic. Anybody, anybody know what I'm talking about here? They they cooked them just right. They had the seasoning salt on it. They're supposed to put a picture up there. I don't know if they did of, of this of this. And, you know, back at back in the '80s, man. Well, they bulldozed that whole thing down. Now and it's a bank. But man, I tell you what, I just sometimes long to have some L and J fries. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Longing for something you can't, you feel like you can't have or whatever. No, you don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Something, something you like. Anybody like something? You're like, man, I wish I could have that. Yeah. Now, I probably shouldn't be talking about French fries as it gets closer to noon, but, <laughs> but uh, man, I'm telling you, you know, uh, I'm probably, you know, biased, but those were the best fries I ever had. And, you know, and, and uh, man, I, you know, I go back home, you know, to visit my mom and I, I can't eat the fries anymore. It's like my town is ruined. There's probably other reasons why it's ruined, but that's the particular reason to me that it's ruined. You know, so, so longing for something, yearning after something, and this is, I know this is ridiculous. I mean, you know, what do you care of French fries? But, but I really liked them. They were good, but maybe there's other things you yearn for that are a little more substantial. I don't know today, if you, if you think about that, you know, I think a lot of us yearn for, for friends and for deeper meaning in life. You know, anybody know what I'm talking about? Just, just peace and yes. prosperity and, and beauty and all these things. I mean, I, I yearn for that too. I want goodness in our world. I want goodness in our city. I want our church here to explode in favor and life and good. I want good for you personally. That's something I yearn for in my own heart. I wanna hear, you know, as we head into the back end of 2022 and on to 2023, I want to hear all these stories of people doing great and, you know, finding their place in this world and, you know, and just doing better with their job and, 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 and just learning to really walk in the things of God. Anybody yearn for that type of thing? But, you know, there, there's, there's another yearning I want to talk about here today. It's, it's rooted in this new series we're starting, Pentecost. And, and I, I was thinking a little bit about what Paul talked about in Romans 8, 26. He talked about, you know, having, you know, like groans too deep for words. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like sounds coming out of you that don't even make sense to you, but they speak of a deeper longing, a deeper desire, a longing for something more substantial. Sounds that come forth that others look at you and go, gosh, that sounds like gibberish. Kind of like what Pastor Steve was talking about, getting up, you know, in the middle of the night. Just these, these sounds, these, this place that's coming out of you, that's not of you, that's greater than you, a yearning for something greater, something more powerful, something more dynamic, certainly something much better than L and J French fries. <laughs> you know, longings, desire. You know, I believe that throughout the Bible, you know, it's trying to talk to us about that. I think inside of all of us. There is a desire to connect with God on a deeper level. Inside us, there's a longing for us to be able to open our mouths and the mysteries of heaven come rattling out. There's a part of us that wants to be so deeply connected to God that we can feel him, that we can sense him, that we're strong in who he is and that we want to walk and move and go. And, and even today, if you're new and maybe you're not even a believer, inside you, I believe that yearning is there too. A longing, a desire, like, I need this. I want this. Years ago, Bono from U2, one of the rock and roll bands, who happens to be a Christian, but he said this, all rock and roll is either trying to find God or run from him. Over and over again in our culture, you know, when we sing about love, singing about, you know, romance or whatever, sometimes we're not really singing about that at all. We're singing about God. There's nothing on earth that can meet that deep place within us. 
There's nothing on earth that just through creativity or romance or, or whatever, you know, as good as all of that might be, none of that can meet the longing that's in the depths of your soul. None of it can produce in you groans that are beyond words. Nothing in this earth can actually produce in you what you're longing for in the deepest place of your life. So today I'd like to talk to you about what I believe that longing really is. That, that, that empowerment, that connection, that, that place with God filled with power and glory and might. Anybody know what I'm talking about here today? That's what I believe you're really yearning for, you're really longing for. If you got your Bible, why don't you turn with me here? We're gonna go over to Acts chapter one, verse six. I'm sorry, verse three. You know, I think it's kind of important to listen to stuff Jesus says. Anybody, anybody think that might be? I mean, we're Christians, right? You know, we're supposed to like pay attention to Jesus, you know? I mean, I know he did some stuff, but he said some stuff too. Sometimes at church, we just focus on the stuff he did and not the things he said. But wouldn't you think for just a minute, some of the last things he said before he went back to heaven would have some importance? What do you think? Anybody think that might, might have some importance? Right. Yeah, if you're getting ready to go on a trip and you're gonna talk to your kids, you might say something important to them or, or whatever, you know? There, there, there's important things that we need to pay attention to. Acts chapter one, verse three here, it says, during the 40 days after his crucifixion, Jesus appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So Jesus, of course, died on the cross. And here it is a number of days afterward. He's beginning to meet with his followers. He's showing them truths. He's, he's revealing to them that he's really alive. He's eating a meal with them. And they're going, well, this is not just a ghost. This is a, a man, resurrected man. This is real. This is dynamic. And we know that Christianity is true, among other reasons, because the people who followed him were willing to die to claim that he rose from the dead. No man hardly is willing to die for a lie. These men and women saw him, encountered him, felt the wound, wounds in his hands, the spear mark in the side. They watched him eat. They listened to him, and he began to tell them important things, particularly about the reality of the kingdom of God. Jesus is revealing that there's something of God and his rule breaking into the earth. It's powerful. Verse four, it says, while he was eating with them, he commanded them. So it's kind of getting down to one of his last things he talked to him about here. He said this, you know, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. You know, Jesus, like any good spiritual father and all, he says, I gotta remind you of something I already told you. Don't run out of town here. I want you to wait. I want you to gather. I want you to prepare your hearts for something good, a good gift from heaven. I told you about this before. It's a gift. How many of you guys like gifts? Some of you are lying. I only see a few hands out here. There's a bunch of you like gifts. No, you just like expensive gifts. You don't want socks. You want something from the Apple store. You want something like that, but... I, Gifts, everybody likes gifts. It's great to have gifts, but this is a gift from God. Something God wants to give us, something God has in his heart to pour out upon us. Some of you know where I'm going with this, but, but let's listen to this, let's unpack this. We're talking about a longing. See, I don't know if they knew there was a longing in their heart for this. I don't know if today, if you know there's a longing in your heart for this, but even if you've tasted it before, you hunger for it even deeper and even more. But Jesus says this here, John the Baptist, he baptized you with water. He immersed you in water, he dumped you under all the way. But in just a few days, you will be baptized, you will be immersed, you'll be completely submerged with the Holy Spirit. It's like, you know, I know you have the Holy Spirit in you, but in a short time from now, you're not only gonna have it in you, you're gonna have it on you, you're gonna wear it like a cloak. It's gonna be something exuding from you. It's something that's gonna define you, something that's gonna transform you, something that's gonna give you what you need to prevail in the face of trouble 
in the face of poverty, in the face of government overreach, to give you strength, to give you hope, to enable you to rise in difficult times. In case you guys don't know, the word bap- baptize is actually a Greek word that we just made into English because people are too chicken to say baptism was immersion because the sprinkler folks didn't want to use that word that way. So we made up a new word so we could be more vague. But the word means dunk somebody. John the Baptist dunked you and you had water all over your face. You were just dripping with water. It was in your hair, it was in your mouth, in your nose. And just in the same way you were immersed in water, I am sending the Holy Spirit and he will immerse you in in the power of the Lord. He will immerse you, he will baptize you. And again, I wanna reiterate this, that, that when one is saved, you know, the Holy Spirit comes alive within them and that's good, we want that. It's great to have the, you know, the glass of water and the water's inside it. What's even cooler when you pick up the glass of water and you dump the whole cup, water and all, into the fish tank. And now that glass doesn't just have water on the inside, it has it on the outside and everywhere else. It's immersion. It's a new reality that would change them not only on the inside but on the outside to clothe them with power from on high like the great prophets of old, like Elijah, like Isaiah, the men who spoke and, 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 and stood and proclaimed the marvelous things of God. This is, this, is, this is important things. This is the last thing Jesus is talking about. I know some of you have read over this a lot over the years, but, but just let's reflect on it a little bit more here today because we're talking about it. We want to get a fresh vision for it because I think sometimes we reduce this down to something smaller than it really is. This is a big deal. This kind of imagery this kind of experience, this is not just a, a talk, this is an encounter. I know some of you in here have had these kinds of encounters, but some of you haven't. And part of my goal today is to put a hunger in you to want even more, to desire to walk in even more of the things of God. You say, well, I believe John three sixteen. Good, well, you need to believe Acts chapter one, verse six, seven, eight, two. It's all in the Bible, it's all there, it's all important. So Jesus starts talking about empowerment. He's talking about this great move. He's talking about them being positioned to change the world. And just like any smart folks, the disciples want to start talking to him about politics. You know, somebody say, I thought that was just the current age. No, it's every age. So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking, Lord, is it time for you to, you know, get things in store for Israel here? You know, get get everything kind of set up governmentally the way we, we think it ought to be and Restore the kingdom the way we've envisioned. And and the Lord's like, "Uh, hold on a minute now. The Father alone has authority to set dates and times. I don't really want to talk to you about politics or your particular vision of government, as important as that might be. I want to talk to you about something bigger. I don't want you to just think about, you know, those things in terms of your own life. I want you to begin to envision how I'm going to change the world. I want you to envision an empowerment that will in fact fix those issues. But I want you to see bigger. I want you to get beyond yourself. They're saying, is it time to restore your kingdom? But they meant it a certain way. And Jesus wanted to tell them that it is time to restore his kingdom, but it's not the way they think. He replied, the Father alone has given the authority to set dates and times. They're not for you to know, but, but the kingdom is going to be established now. But you will receive power. It's one of my Kathy verses right here. You shall receive dunamis, you know, power of God, that dynamic power of God. You're gonna receive power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. People say, I don't know if I've really ever had the Holy Spirit come on to me. Well, if you've never had any power, you haven't had that experience. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, there's power. You can feel it. it starts burning through you, man. It's like, you know, you feel your, like your blood pumping. You can feel like the hair on the back of your neck stand up. You suddenly can see clearer. You have this boldness to speak. 
You have faith to change the world. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you become like a new person. You say, I don't know if I've ever experienced that. Well, if you've never actually stepped into that kind of position, you probably haven't had the power come on you. You say, well, man, I don't know about that. No, I'm telling you in the depths of your soul, you're longing for this. And even if you've had this experience before within you, there's a desire to keep it going, to keep it burning. You know, just just because you got a flame doesn't mean you don't need to drop another log on it, right? You know, get you some more gasoline on the fire. Come on. It's good stuff. But you receive power. So if I can do it like a Pentecostal, Joshua, power. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now notice it didn't say you will witness. Now I grew up in church, they always told me you're gonna get powered up by the Holy Spirit and you're gonna go around and start witnessing to people. That's good to do, but that's not what the scripture's saying. It says that you're gonna be transformed, you as a person. You are gonna become a witness. That means your life, your attitude, your walk, your conversation, the way you spend money, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you treat your wife or your husband. You're gonna become something. You're gonna become a witness. It's good to talk. It's better to display. It's funny when you display, it's not hard to talk. You just be who you are. Power comes on you and you become something. People say, well, I've been powered by the Holy Spirit. Well, man, I don't know if you've ever become anything or not. You know, have you become something yet? I know Pastor Steve, he's calling us to become great things. I know there's people here that have become great things. Let's become something good as that spirit comes on us. Witnesses. Telling me about, telling, talking about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You guys kind of know this. this is, he says, I want you to talk about me in your hometown. I want you walking around Lee Summit talking about Jesus. But you walking around Raymore just, just declaring the goodness of God. You know, I want you walking around, you know, independence, you know, maybe shopping, but you're saying Jesus has changed the world. Yeah. Leewood, Kansas, man, I'm, I'm filled with Jesus. I love Jesus. Do you know Jesus? You're talking about him in your hometown, but not just your hometown. You're talking about him in your state, yeah. talking about him all over Missouri, all over Kansas. I want people to know Jesus. I want people to see the power of Jesus. And you're talking about him in your country, in the United States. We want United States Filled with power. We need revival bad in the United States. We pray that God would come and deliver us and help us and rescue us. But not just the United States, but to the very ends of the earth. Amen. To the whole face of the globe. That empowerment changing us, equipping us, facilitating something amazing, something powerful. This is what Jesus is talking about. Do you think maybe this is some things worth paying attention to? I know some of you heard these, these kinds of things a lot. Well, let's get up to the thing he was gonna talk about here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack a few other things after we get there, because this longing that you have in your heart is bigger than you realize, and it's bigger in the biblical tradition than most people know. And when I grew up hearing about Pentecostal power, I only heard it in a very narrow sense. I only heard it just maybe from Acts 2. But I didn't realize the whole Bible is filled with language, pictures, and things that begin to take us to this reality. And this reality is much bigger than just you talking in tongues. Heavens knows I want you to speak with powerful prophetic speech and speak in tongues. Definitely part of it. But it's more than that. It's a bigger picture of something God is wanting to do. And when I was growing up, I heard about spirit baptism. I heard about tongues. But nobody told me the rest of the story. They didn't tell me it's tied to a bigger picture, a, a larger purpose, a greater truth. All right, Acts 2.1, you guys know this. 
as it says in the, in the, like the New King James, whatever, the day of Pentecost had finally come. They've been waiting for this day. Pentecost. And all the believers were together in one place and suddenly, all at once, there was nothing and then there was something. That's how God works sometimes. So I gotta keep praying. You know, I've noticed this with healing sometimes. You gotta keep believing. Sometimes, you know, there's pain and you just believe and all of a sudden then the pain's gone. Just suddenly, suddenly, boom. There was a sound from heaven. Suddenly there's a sound or something beginning to, 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 to make a rattle in the air. There's like a, it's like a roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. And then there appeared to be like flames or tongues of fire, fire and wind and, 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 and sound and, and this, this thunderous kind of thing. Anybody ever heard of that before in the Bible? Over and over again in the moments when God showed up and the, what they call the theophanies, God appearances before Elijah, you know. And, and, you know, the Bible talks about the angels are like winds and the servants like flames of fire. When God and the, and the, and the hosts of heaven come near us, the flames and the fire and the wind begins to stir because the activity of God's coming close. And as that happened, you know, the original Pentecost, you guys may not know this, but but Pentecost, you know, it really means 50. It's a, it's Feast of Weeks. It's a, it's a festival that originally was instituted 50 days after the original Passover. The, the lamb was slain. Israel was freed. They left the land of Egypt. And 50 days later on the mountain, God began to give Moses his word. He began to reveal his precepts, his law, his truth to Israel through Moses. And if you read that story like in Exodus chapter 19 and 20, you read a story about mountains and you read about fire and you read about thunder and wind and these thunderous activities. And, and it begins to just really shake up the whole world. It shakes up the whole land. One of the Jewish, uh, what they call Midrash statements said this, that when they were on the mountain or the Israel was around the mountain, they got afraid because they heard God's voices coming from a hundred different directions. Because it was this amazing moment and God's voice is not as if we know it. It's this powerful reality. And on Pentecost, the original Pentecost, there was this sound of multiple sounds and voice that some were frightened and that's when they were maybe unwilling to step fully into all that God intended. The original Pentecost was supposed to be an encounter where all the sons and daughters of God met God, heard his voice, and lived out their calling to become the images of God on this earth. But they were unwilling to do that. The Pentecost became a special holiday. It was a day where they celebrated the people received the word. It was a day that people celebrated God's presence in his fire. But as time went on, it also became a festival of covenant renewal. It was a time in which people said, you know what? We're going to get ourselves back right with God. We've maybe missed things, and now's the time to make it right. So it's a special holiday, a special time, a season of the word. So here we are in Acts 2, and it's now 50 days after Jesus, the Lamb of God, has been slain. And now we have the second Pentecost in which God comes down and he begins to put his word on the hearts and minds of his people and they begin to speak out the mysteries of heaven. They begin to speak in tongues. And this is this powerful moment. You say, well, what, what, what's the big deal about speaking in tongues? Well, it's got a big deal in a lot of ways. If you talk in a way that you can't talk, that's a miracle, right? But not just that. As the people of God begin to speak in tongues, it begins to bring a reversal of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, in which humanity in their wickedness and pride and self-effort wanted to defy God and reject his ways, and God divided their tongues as a, a, as a judgment. And now in the fullness of time, as the cross comes forth, there's a new day, a new season, a new era, a time of covenant renewal a longing that had been going on for a long time. Moses in Numbers chapter 11 said, I wish that all of God's people were prophets and the Spirit of God would come upon them. You guys know these passages. 
Joel talks about it too, you know, in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy, old men will dream dreams. In the day of days, he's saying, in the fullness of time, I'm gonna cause my spirit to come down upon people and they will speak, they will proclaim, they will reveal who I am and it will be a sign of the era that's been being launched. Isaiah, Isaiah 44, the Lord said this to him. He said, I'll pour out my water to quench your thirst and irrigate your parched fields and I will pour out my spirit on your children and my blessing on them and they will thrive like watered grass as willows on the river bank. And they will pr proudly proclaim, I belong to God. They'll begin to speak and declare. But here's an important one here. Ezekiel talked about it too. Ezekiel 36, 25. I'll sprinkle clean water on you and you'll be clean. Your filth will be washed away. And you'll no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart. And I'll put a new spirit inside of you. And I will take out that stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. You see, this longing had been in the Bible for a long time. This longing had been for years. There was a longing that someday all of the people of God would be able to know God. There was a longing that someday all of the people of God could not only have him in them, but they would begin to be changed and begin to speak and reveal and display through their own lives that God is real and that they served him. Yeah. There's a longing for that, their desire. Over and over again, the Bible says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yeah. That the mouth is the symbol of your soul, of the symbol of your heart. And the longing is somehow the ancients, the prophets of old said, you know what? There's gonna come a day. There's coming a season. They said this in the era that we live in, only certain ones can have the Spirit come upon them like a garment. Only the kings, only the priests, only the prophets. But Moses said, I long that all of God's people would be prophets. Joel said, in the day of days, not the last days of creation, but in the day of days, in the day of visitation, the Lord will come and he'll pour out his spirit upon sons and daughters, but not just people here in Israel, but those far away, those in distant lands, both men and women, no one excluded from the reality of this new day, of this new dawning era, of this time. So the day of Pentecost is a culmination of so many different things coming together. There's a longing for a day in which people would come alive. There's a longing for a day in which people begin to speak the things of God. But there's also a longing for the Messiah and longing for the new covenant era that begins to change and bring everything into fuller and richer expression. And I love this. Here just a, a few weeks ago, one of my good friends, a professor, spoke here at church, I think about eight years ago, Dr. John Mark Ruthven passed away. But he, uh, he talked to me uh, a lot about this passage and, and I think about him a lot when I read it. But Isaiah said this, Isaiah 59, 21, he says, as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. And you could probably insert the word new. This is my new covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that's on you and my words that I've put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on forever. So we know what this passage says? The sign of the new covenant is tongues and prophetic speech in the mouths of God's people. You say, well, I don't know why I need to talk in tongues. I don't know, why, 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 are, we, why are we talking about all this stuff? Because it is rooted in the unleashing of the prophetic people. It's the, rooted in the declaration of the people of God being dwelled in, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's a sign that we too are like the prophets. That we too have upon us the strength, power, and glory of Jesus. That we too are now participants in the new covenant realities of Jesus' shed blood. 
and that he has broken open the door to something fantastic, to something amazing, and he is inviting every one of us, young and old, poor and rich, man or woman, all of us can be empowered from on high. I wanna suggest to you here today that there's more to this story than we realize. Like I said, when I was growing up and the Pentecostal church I was in, they would just quote Acts 2 and say, well, they talked in tongues, so you should too. Okay. Well, Jesus stuck mud in somebody's eye. Should I do that too? <laughs> I mean, I, I get it. I get it. I mean, you know, yeah, Acts 2, that, that's a pattern. I get it. That, that, that's okay. But what if I told you there's more to this? What if I told you this is not just about looking at one like historical example or two or three, but it's rooted in this idea of the people of God being like prophets, the people of God speaking the wonders and the mysteries of God and this being an unfathomable sign and a reversal of the Tower of Babel. If you listen, if you look at the listing of the nations, in Acts chapter two that heard the tongue speech in Jerusalem, it's almost the same list as Genesis chapter 11. That God is inverting the judgment on the nations. He is inverting the curse. He's inverting the men and women who are Gentiles, the wicked nations who, who could not and did not know God can now have God come upon them once again. This is now a new Pentecost, it's a new unveiling and releasing of God's law. But it's, as, as Ezekiel was suggesting, it's, it's coming on our hearts. Yeah. It's coming on our minds. It's coming alive in our emotions, in our eyeballs, in our speech, in, our, in, our, in all of who we are, that we are aligning with God's truths, aligning with his principles, aligning with his words. But some of it, we're just doing it because we feel it, yeah. because we sense it. Because we're being led by God, maybe at two in the morning. That we're coming and we're listening and we're responding and discovering what it means to be the men and women of God. This is my new covenant with them. The Lord said through Isaiah, my spirit who's on you and my words that I've put in your mouth will not depart. We have a longing in our soul to express groans that are beyond words. We have a longing in our soul, soul to join a chorus of people who are filled with power and might and majesty. We have a longing in our soul to do something more than we've ever imagined. And part of it is not about being fancy, it's not about having a deep education, it's not about doing everything right, but it's about submitting yourself to God. It's about falling on your face and loving Him it's about letting him fill your heart, to fill your soul, to fill your imagination, and that you begin to let him baptize you with power. You get immersed. You get dunked. You get submerged in the fullness of his power, of his strength, of his goodness, of his life. And as you come out of that water, as you come out of that submersion, you're just filled with joy. You're filled with life. You're filled with power. And you're talking. Amazing, maybe even crazy things. So I say, I don't want to talk about crazy things. That probably means you've never done it. It's awful fun to speak in tongues. You should try it sometime. I get it, you can't do it in the flesh, but that's the thing. God will send his spirit, he'll send his power. He'll send his mind. I believe that spirit baptism and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began in Acts 2 is one of the distinguishing marks of the new era that we live in. It's one of the distinguishing marks of the new covenant, and it's one of the things that defines the people of God in this hour. And not only that, but it equips us to walk in power. It equips us to pray for the sick. It equips us to be generous, to be good husbands and good mothers and and, 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 to, and to walk the things of God in, a, in an effective and dynamic way. I know a lot of us, all of us in here probably struggle with things. I know I do, some things. But his power gives us everything that we need. And as we make groans too deep for words, our hearts and minds and our emotions begin to change. 
As we align with the frequency of heaven, it's amazing how our inner frequencies change. It's amazing how as we speak of the resonance of heaven, that vibration begins to reverberate through the air, through the church, through the nation, and changes the very context, changes the very environment. It causes the darkness to flee. So here we're talking about Pentecost today. Ancient Pentecost was important, but this Pentecost is important too. And here in just a, you know, a few Sundays, we're gonna be entering into Pentecost Sunday, and I'm looking forward to Pastor Steve talking to us and maybe even taking us deeper into an experience of this. But I'm telling you, today we're living in the day of Pentecost. We're living in the day of empowerment. We're living in the day where the Holy Spirit can and will come upon you. And this isn't just an option. I mean, this is something we need to grab a hold of. Now, I get it. I mean, you can be saved without having the Holy Spirit empowerment come on you. I mean, just like you can get somewhere on a horse instead of a plane. I get it. I get it. I mean, if you want to ride a horse everywhere, that's your choice. I think I'll take the 747 if I want to go somewhere far enough. Uh, I mean, you know, you don't have to be empowered by God to be saved, but why wouldn't you want to be? Why wouldn't you want to be? I mean, I want his power. I need to be smarter. I need to be kinder. I need, I need stuff. I need his empowerment to come on me. I need, I need some new clothes. I want to throw off my old garment. Throw off my beggar's cloak. Put on a new garment. To be clothed with power from on high. To have that draping over me, to, to have a strength. Sometimes I think about this, and uh, I remember after I first got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I was, I was 17 years old, and I was so filled with power, I was so excited, so wanting to touch everybody's lives and just talk to them about Jesus. And I come walking into a gas station, and the gas station clerk looks at me and goes, You're one of those Christians, aren't you? I can tell. I don't hear that near enough. <laughs> but that, that empowerment comes on, it changes you. Puts a smile on your face. Puts some hope in you. Makes you wanna serve. Sometimes I get it, we don't wanna serve. Makes you wanna come to church. Makes you wanna give money. Makes you wanna help people. Empowers you to become something to express something. You say, well, what about tongues? Well, tongues are part of the sign, but they're not the goal. You know, I, I, this is a silly illustration, but I'll, I'll do it here now. You know, when you go to the store and you buy shoes, the tongues come with them. I don't pay for the tongues separate with my shoe here. You know, you know the tongues come with the shoes. And the tongues come with the empowerment. I'm for tongues, please hear me. We have to, we need some tongues, we need some signs. I need your mouth rattling off the glories of heaven. That's important. That shouldn't be excluded here. But in the end, that's not the goal. You'll receive power. You'll receive the strength of God in your life. You'll receive the ability to, to walk with strength, with wisdom with integrity, yeah. with passion, with, with, with boldness, yeah. with hope. So I didn't, you somebody say, well, I didn't know tongues and spirit baptism was all this. I get it, I didn't either. Yeah. I think it was my second or third year of Bible college, I had some Presbyterian friends come up and they started trying to talk me out of the belief in spirit baptism. And they talked to me and, and, they, and they, they said, they were telling, telling me all this stuff and and, and, and I was struggling for a while because, the, you know, they were framing up the argument wrong, but they were trying to tell me otherwise. And, but I went in and started digging a little deeper. I said, hold on a minute. You guys are full of mess. This is real. This is rooted all the way back in the Old Testament. 
It's the hope of the ages, the longing that the empowered people of God, speaking the mysteries of heaven, speaking the Torah of God, even the Gentiles who've been far from God, speaking the mysteries of God, being like Saul in the days of old when he came upon the prophets and he was overwhelmed and began to speak in tongues or have some kind of unusual ecstatic experience. And they said, is Saul among the prophets now? How could wicked old Saul even be filled up with that? It was a picture. The empowerment, the longing, the Bible's filled with that longing. Joel and Moses, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Someday there will be a people. Someday there will be an outpouring of power. Someday those near and far will be able to be filled with the glory of heaven. And they will speak and it will just be amazing. And so often in church, we hear about one of these days Someday in the sweet by and by. But you know what today, friends? This is not a one of these days messages. Today, you are living in the reality of the age of the Spirit. Today, you are living in the reality of the kingdom of God. And today, my friends, you're living in the reality of the new covenant. And we, the men and women of God, have been called to be empowered called to be changed, called to be equipped, called to be overwhelmed and endued with power from on high. And I would dare say to you this, if my worship team friends can come on up here, I would dare say this to you, whether you know it or not, that this is the longing of your heart. This is the thing that God has put in you. This is your desire is to know God deeply to know him powerfully. Your desire is for him to fill your mouth with wonder. Your desire is to be positioned to speak groans that are beyond words, to speak of a reality that quickens the heart, that quickens the soul, that it causes your imagination to come alive, that causes your humanity to be brought into right order, that causes all of who you are to be renewed. What if I told you that today we have within our grasp something that the ancients longed for? What if I told you today that we have the full portion of what Jesus purchased on the cross to open up a new era, to open up a new season, to open up the, the successful transformation of the earth? What if I told you that this empowerment, the spirit baptism, this tongue speech and all of this is a picture, it's a declaration, it's a sign. It's a thundering truth that reveals that God is transforming the earth now and that you're in the midst of it. This is bigger than you've ever imagined. Does anybody here have groans that are beyond words? Does anybody ever feel something in the depths of your soul? Did you ever have that? You ever wake up in that, you know, sometimes you got a frustration, a desire, a longing. Call it revival, call it whatever you want. Uh, 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 an agitation in you. Oh. I'm so thankful my pastors have that. Pastor he's always had that agitation. I asked him years ago, does it ever go away? And he looked at me and said, no. <laughs> that holy dissatisfaction. That, that something out of you comes out. It might be mystery to others, but it's beauty to heaven. It might sound like gibberish on earth, but it might be the tongues of angels. It might just sound like anger or frustration or fear, but it actually sounds like groans. They're too deep for words a people being immersed, a people being empowered, a people that can rise up in the face of the empire of Rome in the wickedness and the violence of Nero and others who would kill them and they stood for Jesus anyway. For Peter who died upside down on the cross who would never relinquish his faith in Jesus because he'd been so empowered, the coward became the hero. You say, what's all this tongue stuff? It's bigger than you've ever imagined. 
What's all this Holy Spirit stuff? It's a sign. What is all this? This is, this is a declaration that we are the real people of God, that we are the ones walking in the fullness of what God has intended in this age. It's so easy to look at what's ahead, but could you just take a minute with me and look at what's here right now? What if we have a huge down payment on everything that is to come? What if there's more that we can access right here today than we've ever imagined? It's Pentecost season, guys, and it's time to get realigned with that beauty and power of the Holy Spirit, to be equipped, to be strengthened, to become something. The Lord wants it, but I know you want it too. I believe this is the yearning. This is the longing. This is the desire. Could the prayer teams come up? In the day of days, in the fullness of time, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Peter stood up there at Acts 2, and he said that this is exactly what's happened. Peter's dream has been fulfilled. That we're living in the fullness of time. We are living in the age of Messiah. We're living in the age of the Spirit. We're living in which we can be overwhelmed with power. That we can be immersed. That we can be strengthened. That we can be strong. And I guess the question is, why wouldn't anybody absolutely run for this? Why wouldn't somebody say, this is exactly what I've been going after. This is what I want. Whether you've been baptized in the Spirit or not, today is a day that you can begin to encounter the power, the strength, and the goodness of Jesus Christ. That you can have the wonder of His Holy Spirit come on you, touch you, help you, release healing, release power. The question is, are you going to respond? Are you going to say, I want this? That I'm going to run into this calling, run into this destiny, run into what's available to me. Will I grab hold of what God has destined for my life? What are you going to do? Who are you going to be? Where are you going to go? Right now, I'm asking. Right now, if you're ready, if you want this, I'm going to ask you, come right now. Right now.